Ronnie, thank you. I'll, I'll simply say that I'm thrilled that the Tribune has an opportunity to partner with the LBJ School. We're going to do some great things together involving students and coursework and programs like this one. And so thank you very much, and thank you to Admiral Inman and the staff at the LBJ School for making that possible. Very much appreciate it. Welcome to everybody. It's an honor to be here today to uh, put on the first of the perspective series for the year. We have some terrific ones coming up. We know we have the mayor of Houston, Bill White, in November and some great ones coming up in December and January and good plans for the spring. But today we're fortunate to kick off the Perspectives series this year with an old friend of Texas and, the, and UT and of mine and one of the great journalists working in this country today, Karen Tumulty. Karen, uh, many of you may know, is a native of Texas. She grew up in San Antonio, went to high school in San Antonio in Austin, graduated from Crockett High School, and then came to the University of Texas where she graduated with a BA in journalism with high honors from the communication school went on to, to Harvard Business School where she graduated with an MBA. She began her career in journalism with the San Antonio Light, but coming out of the MBA program in Harvard, went to work for the Los Angeles Times where she spent 14 years as a reporter covering Congress and business and a number of topics, and now is in her 15th year with Time Magazine. She joined the staff of Time in 1994 as a congressional reporter. In 1996 became a White House correspondent covering the Clinton administration and in 2001 became national political correspondent for Time, a position that she still holds today. Karen, if you read the magazine, is, is, a, is a very present journalist. She's in the magazine practically every week. She writes things that you read not only in the magazine's print version, but also online. The Swampland blog may as well be the Tumulty blog, as far as I'm concerned, based on the number of times she posts and the fact that she seems to have such an ownership over the material. There are other bloggers, of course, who are wonderful, but I always read that blog for Karen. And one of the things that we've talked about over the years and that we'll talk about today is the, the way that her job as a journalist has changed. Is she really a print journalist who blogs or a blogger who happens to publish in print? It's really a little bit of both. But the thing I want to say about Karen most of all that I can say in Karen's presence and to all of you is that if you ask people in the Capitol who are the most respected journalists, who are the most fair journalists, what you'll hear from politicians, what you'll hear from fellow reporters, and what you hear from readers uniformly is that Karen is near the top of that list. It's an honor always to have her back in Austin. Please join me in welcoming UT alumnus Karen Tumblr. <laughs> There's so much to talk about. And I, of course, last night thought, what are all the great things I'm going to talk to Karen about, not thinking that I would wake up this morning to discover the news that depending Hi. upon your perspective, the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to either President Obama or President not Bush. Right. Uh, what, who actually won this? Who actually won the Peace Prize? Was it Obama or not Bush? And what are we, if anything, to make of the significance of this? Well, first of all, let me apologize for my voice, which isn't what it should be today. Uh, my understanding is that Kanye West has already issued a statement saying it should have gone to Beyonce. <laughs> um, Excellent. Excellent. But um, you know, I think I think the president, who by all accounts they were shocked at the White House when this happened. Um, apparently it went out at 5 o'clock this morning from the Situation Room as one of their morning items of interest. So everybody got this little item of interest in their email saying <laughs> Barack Obama wins the Nobel Peace Prize. I think he framed it right when he said, you know, this was more about aspirations and sort of a, what, the, what the world wants to be a call to action than, of course, anything that the president actually accomplished. But I do think that that combined with Al Gore last year does suggest that the judges in Oslo, they, there is a definite not Bush caucus there. They, they, they cast a vote, yes. right, yeah. Uh, I discovered this, as many people probably did this morning when they woke up, not in a, a, a conventional publication, but on Facebook and on Twitter. This was where I came upon the news. And the, the storyline today seemed to be that even by people who are Obama's supporters and friends, that this is actually not a good thing for the president to have won this because it confirms the sense that this is a guy who is being uh, put in a position he's not qualified for, he's being given awards he hasn't actually won or earned. Is there a way that this can actually reverberate negatively back on the president, do you think? I think it really depends on how they handle it. Um, and I think, like I said, I think the statement that he came out with this morning was graceful and humble, but they've got to you know they've got to they've got to be careful about this. I I was struck, for instance, with last week when they were in Copenhagen. You know, people were going through um, Michelle Obama's speech and counting the number of times she used the word I and me. 
Um, they do need to make sure that this is associated with his agenda and not with him as a person. Right. Now, of course, the other side of this is that his critics have to be careful as well, presumably, just as there seem to be cheering about the U.S. not getting the Olympics in Chicago. There's at least today a, a concern that you over you overdo it on the criticism of Obama and in fact look like you're not supporting the president or supporting the general principle at work here. And that's right. And we saw a statement come out of the RNC, Chairman Michael Steele, an hour and a half probably before Obama's own statement, essentially saying this award is worthless. And I do think that at some point that makes it look like, again, you're rooting against the home team here. Everything is being politicized. Well, especially since, you know, the RNC seems to be on the same page with, you know, Hamas and the Taliban on this too, which issued similar statements. Well, uh, let, me, uh, let me transition away from that to something truly local and parochial, and that is the University of Texas. I'm staring at my friend Patty Hart, one of the great journalists at the Capitol who worked for Texas Monthly and still does for many years. Uh, she, along with Christy Hoppe of the Dallas News and Mary Walsh of CBS News, and I guess in the same orbit, Beth Freerking of Politico, you all were this kind of great group of students who are also at the Texan and who uh, your lives have really been quite remarkable. The success you've had is a great reflection on the time that you were here and on the work that you did and on, your, on, on all of you. Can you talk about that time here at the university? This would have been in the mid-70s, right? Yeah, it was, um, I think we were probably the first generation of people to come to journalism school post Watergate, which, which was a really kind of idealistic time for, for journalism and for people having a sense of what the possibilities of journalism were. And, you know, there, people were just flooding journalism schools at the time. You know, we were naive enough to think that we faced a bad job market compared to what people are facing today. Um, but it was a very energetic time. Um, the Daily Texan, I think, was, it was a real agenda setter, um, both in Austin and I think across the state. Yeah. It actually did present a competition of a sort for the, for the Daily Paper, didn't it? Right, at one point while we were there, Patty, you'd be able to check me on this, I believe we lost our AP, our student AP rate because the Austin American Statesman went to the Associated Press and contended that we were actual competition for them. Yeah. Well, we'll, uh, we'll talk about the state of the media in a little while. I want to talk about the arc of your career, though. So you, you decided to go to business school after leaving the University of Texas. Clearly, you studied in the communication school, majored in journalism, and then came out and became a journalist. But you chose to go to business school as opposed to a different path. Why, why did you take that path? Um, because after I'd worked a couple of years at the San Antonio Light and was anxious to sort of move on. It was a really weird time in San Antonio journalism. Uh, it, they had a vigorous competition, but it was Rupert Murdoch's first newspaper in America competing against Hearst. And back in those days, the headlines were things like, baby eats LSD, um, pregnant cat gunned down, um, and so I was. And in fact, that was an actual. This, that was an yes. actual headline. The cat one. Actually, it was gun down pregnant cat fights for life. So, um, <laughs> so, you know, I was pretty clear that mm. I, you know, wanted to move on from San Antonio at some point. And it occurred to me that, you know, specialization was possibly, you know, that there were parts of newspapers that were really expanding, and at that point, business sections were. Plus, I really think that. Understanding economics is just something that helps you no matter what aspect of journalism you go into. And coming out of business school, you indeed went to the Los Angeles Times where you covered yeah. business along with politics. At some point, though, clearly the transition in your own mind or in their mind was made. So you went from being somebody who covered business to being somebody who really covered politics mostly. Was that your choice or somebody else's? Uh, they offered me a transfer to Washington to, to cover the California delegation after I'd been at the paper a couple of years and I jumped at it. Yeah. But it's really interesting though because, like I said, ever since then there really is no story that is not fundamentally about economics. Um, mm -hmm. You look at healthcare right now and it's, you know, the, the whole policy is being driven by the numbers. Right. Well, in fact, the conversation you and I had on the phone a couple of days ago as we were waiting for the CBO numbers to come out was what would the CBO scoring of the Baucus bill be and how would that impact the 
progress of, of health care reform. And really only two people who care right. about that stuff in the weeds would get so excited about the CBO and scoring. And I guess there is probably something to that, that if you care about business, there's business in politics. And probably a lot of non-practicing lawyers who've become journalists would say a version of the same thing. If you care about the law, there's a legal aspect to a lot of this stuff as well. Um, did, did you like politics as, a, as a, an avocation, if not as a, a focus before when you got into it? Was it something you enjoyed covering? I did. I mean, I always have. My, my grandfather in San Antonio was in local politics. He was a county commissioner and ultimately county judge for a number of years. So I had always sort of, politics had sort of been the backdrop of my family growing up. But um, I just love it. I mean, you can... There's just sort of nothing that isn't open to you as a political reporter. I mean, you get to go all over the country and meet all kinds of interesting people. And the kinds of people who run for office, I think, are just fascinating. Fascinating in what way? Some, some <clears throat> people would say that the kind of people who run for office have enormous egos that can never be fully satisfied. Well, that too. Yeah. <laughs> um, you meant the positive part of it. Right. Yeah. Well, th that isn't the positive part. Um, <laughs> I, you know, it, the, just to see men and women who will just sort of put themselves out there day in and day out like that, um, and also to, you know, understand that that what is driven on one level by ego ultimately does things that affects people's lives in such such fundamental ways. Now, of course, there, there are a lot of people today who say, I would be running for office, but for people like Karen Tumulty no. and Evan Smith and Patty Hart who make their lives as candidates and their lives as politicians hell. And they think that somehow the scrutiny of their work in office is a deterrent to their deciding to, to serve the public. What do you think about that? Well, I, you know, I've been watching the, the whole Charlie Rangel saga unfold. I mean, the... Rangel for the benefit Charlie of the audience, Rangel, New York congressman. Chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, and, you know, which is the, the congressional, the House committee that writes the tax law, and it turns out he wasn't paying his taxes. Um, small, small problem. But you sort of watch um, people get into this sphere where they are so insulated from just the normal standards and the normal questions that people should be held to. Um, that I, I just don't think people in our business should make, you know, any apologies about that. I do think there is a a sphere of privacy. I mean, I'm not talking about digging into people's private lives. But I do think that questions like that are totally fair game and should be looked at and probably should be looked at a lot more than they are. Yeah. Now, now, Wrangle, the heat has turned up since you brought up Wrangle. Let me just ask about that. The heat's been turned up on him now. And whatever uh, prospects there were for him skating uh, through this thing, it's looking harder for him rather than easier, isn't it? Right, yeah. right. And I think, you know, the, in fact, the lead editorial in the New York Times today, he's their hometown congressman. As Ways and Means chairman, he brings a lot of goodies to New York, but they are essentially saying they want to see him go. And when, when something like that happens, even today, that tends to be a, a reflection of the climate turning right. on such a politician. So you spent 14 years at the Times. What, what, what do you remember most about the experience of working for a newspaper in those days? Because clearly, whatever you think about the state of the newspaper business today, you and I were talking about this before, it was it was the fat and happy days of the newspaper business, of the journalism business back then, right? Yeah, it was. I mean, it wasn't just in the it wasn't just in the expense accounts that we used to have and, and things like that. But, Although there was some of that. Oh, that was lovely. But um, yeah. <laughs> but when I was in the L.A. Times Washington bureau, we had over forty people covering Washington. At one point, the L.A. Times had three people in Washington covering biotech, um, and you would go through the newsroom and there was an actual labor beat and there would be two or three people covering local labor unions and five people covering education. And you, I think that it was great because you had a real sort of depth of experience and expertise. And those are all the people, unfortunately, who have walked out the door in, in all the waves of layoffs and buyouts. and. I think this is this is the thing that we're gonna we're gonna miss the most. I just think that you know there are some things that the internet just cannot and crowdsourcing cannot duplicate. Your husband was at the L.A. Times for a long time. Still, still he at the still LA is. Times. He covers the State Department. So he's in he's in Washington. So how right. big? Forty people back then when you were at the Times between about eighty one and ninety four, right? Right. 
How many people in the LA Times Bureau in Washington today? Oh boy, the thing is that they have been now combined with all the bureaus of all the Tribune papers, and I, it's probably less than half of that, plus they're serving five or Mul six multiple, papers. Multiple markets, wow. Um, when you went to Time Magazine, you started covering Congress. Well, first of all, why did you make the leap from newspapers to news magazines? Obviously, Time then and now, but especially then, a very attractive brand. You get an opportunity to work there. It's a high point in your career. It was um, just an opportunity to try something different, to try a different kind of reporting and writing. Um, you know, oddly enough, when I started at Time, you know, I, it, I was writing for a magazine. Probably, I'd say, at this point, 80% of my reporting and my writing goes directly onto the web and never sees the print edition at all. That's actually an interesting point I wanted to talk about. You, you and I talked about this the other day, that you had broken a story that got a lot of pickup nationally about a week ago when you interviewed former uh, Republican Majority Leader of the Senate and former Tennessee Senator Bill Frist, uh, who is a doctor by profession prior to getting into the Senate. I assume he's still doing something in the medical field since he left the Senate, and he indicated to you in an interview, you had this exclusively, that he would support some version of health care reform, unlike many of his fellow Republicans. But you did not write that story for the magazine. Right. It was really funny. I, um, it, Bill Frist has a book out, and so I had gotten um, an email from his book publicist saying he's going to be in town next week, and so you want to interview him when he's in town. And I said, well, I'd like to talk to him today. So Frist called me from his Amtrak train, and we were talking. And he was talking about health care reform and saying some very positive things about the whole effort and about Barack Obama for taking it on. And he just volunteered. And, in, you know, if I were in Congress, I'd end up voting for it. And I, I said, what? And he said, I made him repeat it. And he said, he said, yeah, I'd take a lot of heat for it, but that's what leadership is all about. Well, that was such an unusual since then we've had a number of Republicans come forward and say pretty much the same thing. But Bob, Bob Dole, uh, Tommy Thompson, the former governor of Wisconsin and HHS secretary, right. um, and Scott McClellan, who ran the FDA and the Medicare and Medicaid this is programs. A, a Mark, the brother of the former White House press secretary. Right, yeah. and uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Michael Bloomberg, who used right. to be a Republican. Um, but, 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 but Frist, but was, Frist the first. was the first. Right. But this was one of these things I could have, you know, waited for the magazine, but that would have, it would be coming out today, and this happened last Friday. Um, so I didn't even wait to write a regular web story. I just put it directly onto our blog, and within 24 hours, it had had over 100,000 hits, right. and it had gotten an entire story written about it in the New York Times. Now, as a journalist, do you feel that that somehow cheapens or diminishes or in any way negatively impacts the work that you do or the ability that you have? I mean, clearly the influence that you have is no less in a blog post like that than it would be in a long story because, as you say, 100,000 hits, New York Times story. Everybody around the world was saying Karen Tumulty broke the story by interviewing Frist. But certainly when you were back at the Texan with Patty and everybody else, Surely you didn't imagine that the work product that you'd produce years later would be a blog post as opposed to a magazine story or a newspaper story. You know, I am not, I, my feeling, and, and this is a, a great topic of, dis, of conversation. Anytime you get two journalists together over a beer, this is where the conversation goes. I mean, my feeling is, has always been that we are about getting information to people. And in whatever form or vessel that information takes, that's fine with me. You know, I, I'm happy to break news on Twitter. Um, it's, there are, you know, some people who think that this does sort of cheapen it, that everything needs to be wrapped in context and stuff. I don't think so. I mean, I think if, if you're adding to, to what the public knows, you need to go where the public is. Right. How much time do you spend these days on a percentage basis, just estimate, writing stuff that's going to see print, ink on physical paper, and stuff that is specifically targeted to the website for time or specifically the Swampland blog? Wow. I would say, like I said, I believe at this point probably 80% of my time is doing stuff for the web. And if I really want to get it out there fast, I do it directly onto the blog, which doesn't have to go through editing. And, and like I said, then on top of that, there's Twitter. 
Right, and you're actually one of the journalists, I think, who does use Twitter regularly. You now have your own hashtag, thanks to this well, experience. Thank you. Which, that's a I know flattering. That, that, these days, that is the pinnacle of one's career in journalism, to have your own hashtag. Um, uh, Christy Hoppe, your friend, great uh, bureau chief of the Dallas Morning News here in Austin, said on a panel that we sat on together a couple weeks ago that often now the newspapers, at least, have stopped reporting a lot of political stories just outright and that almost the entirety of their work is, comes to life on, on a blog. Um, in your case, you are still publishing long stories often for the magazine, but is it more thematic pieces typically than right. news? Isn't that what it is, more, sum more summary pieces than? Right. You have to, these days the magazine stories come in at a much higher altitude. I mean, we don't do the news of the week anymore. Uh, that, there's, we, there's just, by the time our magazine comes out, we figure people already know the news of the week. So what we, we try to do is give them some perspective give them you know, a way of thinking about it. But I, I had a really interesting experience. Um, in, Jul in January of 2008, I got a call from Teddy Kennedy's people. Um, word had gotten out that, that he was gonna endorse Barack Obama the next day. So they called me up and they said, do you wanna be behind the scenes backstage when this happens, you know, when the whole Kennedy family bestows their benediction on Barack Obama? So I said, sure, but this was a Monday morning. Our magazine closes on a Wednesday. It wasn't gonna be on the newsstands until Friday. And I had this great front row seat all to myself of this amazing event. Right. So I podcasted, I blogged, I wrote a story for our website, I blogged some more. By Wednesday, I got an offer to be on The Daily Show. Um, so by the time the magazine had come out, I, you know, I had, I had used this information in about four or five different forums, mm -hmm. and you know, it ultimately comes out as a two-page story in Time Magazine. But by by then, it was, you know, in the old days, that would have been the only way I could have right. could have used. Let me, let me ask you a cynical question, as only one can in a week in which a venerable brand like Gourmet is folded, which is still kind of hard to imagine. What good is the print? version of Time Magazine in the world that you've described. In other, in other words, you can do all these other things. You can blog and you can podcast and you can post stuff. If you're the people who run Time Inc., why not just say we're going to kill the print version of Time since from a weekly standpoint, I know you don't want that, right, and I don't want that, but why not just get rid of the print version of Time entirely and just gravitate the entire operation to the web since the immediacy of the reporting you're doing is clearly made possible by that the online piece, and it's almost impeded by the by the print part. Well, there's um, if I can just tell one story. When I f the first when I first came to Time, the very first week it was three weeks before the Republicans took over Congress in 1994, and Newt Gingrich was flying around the country, and he wasn't allowing any reporters with him, and so I asked for an interview. He wouldn't give me one, and then I told him there was a Time magazine cover possibly in the works. And the next thing I know, I have one of the six seats on his little airplane. And I said, Congressman, I said, this is great, but I said, what made you change your mind? And Newt Gingrich was able to tell me off the top of his head how many Time Magazine covers Richard Nixon had been on. And I still For him, this was a positive. It was a positive, well, he did. <laughs> Yes, I think he didn't like his first cover a few weeks later, which was the Gingrich who stole Christmas. But um, <laughs> it's a good line, though. But, but I still think there is a, you know, news magazines in particular have a, a way of setting the agenda that I, I just don't think you can do in the web product. Um, it still matters a whole lot if something is going to be on the cover of Time magazine. And is, I, is it still true? I mean, you and I were laughing about another news weekly, not Time, yeah. whose most notable and most recent cover was Is Your Baby Racist? I mean, when, 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 when that's staring at you on the newsstand, I'm sorry, I have to ask myself if the news magazine has jumped the shark institutionally. <laughs> well, and you know, there are the, the clunker covers, but um, I still think, you know, it's, it, it still gives you a chance to raise issues and set the agenda in, in ways that the web has not yet 
adapted to. Do, do you believe that the people who publish exclusively online or almost exclusively online, like your friend Beth Breer King at Politico and her colleagues, who've clearly shaken up the way that news is reported or, you know. But some, by the way, Politico is still making most of its money from the print Because of its print product, product right. But, but clearly the impact that it, it, it is, is felt by, you know, Politico, the impact it has out in the world, I should say, is, is the online product. Mm -hmm. and, You've got a lot of other people who are competing largely online, whether it's Ariana Huffington's site or uh, the Josh Marshall Talking Points Memo site, people who are playing in the same pool that you are. Um, do you look at those people as peer competitors? Oh, gosh, yes. Yeah. Um, there's a, for instance, um, when the first torture memos came out, all the, all the big newspapers and magazines sort of went through them, wrote the headlines, and were sort of done with it a few months back, but it was one blogger, a woman named Marcy Wheeler, who spent the weekend going through these documents and counting the number of times they had waterboarded Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. You know, it was one blogger's enterprise, and what she did ended up, I think, completely reframing the debate. And there is just remarkable work being done out there by bloggers. <coughs> And, you know, the, the best of it makes all of us better. I, I'm tempted to ask why the New York Times or Time Magazine or the Washington Post didn't have somebody counting those times. Why, why, did it no take, kidding. why did it take a blogger to do what you'd imagine a reporter for one of the big media operations should have done and would have done? You know, I can't answer. There's no good answer to that question. There are a lot fewer journalists than there used to be at mainstream publications. But that was one of those things that when... Everybody else saw it. They went, you know, it was it was so obvious, and it's the same thing. Um, Josh Marshall at Talking Points Memo. I mean, there would not have been a U.S. attorney scandal if it hadn't been for one blogger connecting dots in a way that absolutely no mainstream publication was. Now, the advocates for fair and balanced journalism, which I put in air quotes, um, would say that well, Josh Marshall is a polemicist. Josh Marshall's site is a liberal site. And therefore, anything that Josh Marshall writes on these to topics should be summarily dismissed as, you know, advocacy journalism. It's not the kind of stuff that good, honest, honorable people publish. What do you say about that? Well, I think that just because it's advocacy journalism doesn't mean it's not right. And with Josh Marshall, what happened was he was on to something, and it was a legitimate issue. And, um, you know, that that mm -hmm. is what drove it. It was it was the substance that that finally drove it, not the you know, not the advocacy. Let me uh, come back into the, the work that you did as White House correspondent for five years at time. So you covered the latter part of the Clinton administration. You got in there right as the going was good. Right, huh? or bad. Uh, as the Or bad, or, you know, but in our world, you know, bad for the rest of the country, great for us. It's, you know, if journalists are selfish about it, in some ways, we're, their bad news is our good news, right? So you, you got in there just as the Lewinsky scandal was in the preseason. Right. right. It was ramping up. Talk about what it was like to, to cover that. Well, my, uh, my feeling about the White House beat in general is that the, the White House beat is the most prestigious bad job in journalism. Um, unlike Capitol Hill, where people have to answer your questions because they cannot get away from you, at the White House, you're essentially at the mercy of whoever deigns to return your phone calls. And um, the Lewinsky thing was just horrible because there were only three or four people in the building who even had the information. Um, it, basically, the, the whole White House went into lockdown for a couple of years. And also, it just changed, you know, everything became confrontational in a way that I think, you know, the American public recognized it a lot better than those of us who were sort of, you know, in the, in the little atmosphere that we were in. What do you, what do you mean by that? Well, ultimately, you know, people decided that, that this was not, I mean, it was a big deal, but it was not the entire beginning and end of the Clinton presidency. And I think that in some ways, when you are in a real hothouse environment of like a big scandal, it is sometimes hard to sort of see the context. Mm -hmm. is, is that the case with the White House generally? Because, you know, there's been a lot of criticism, of course, in the last administration about how the White House press corps more or less laid down in the run-up to the Iraq war, and even in the beginnings of the war, didn't 
there's been a lot of criticism, fairly or unfairly, of the White House press corps not doing its job. And I wonder if there was a similar situation there where you're so close to it that you've got no perspective on it from, from the outside. <clears throat> well, it's also true that there are some stories that they got faulted for that really can't be reported from the White House. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was good work being done um, in the run-up to the war by outfits like McClatchy, but not by their White House reporters. It's just not, it's not a good position. One of the reasons that I don't think it's the most satisfying job in journalism is that you don't have the tools to, to put things in perspective, I think. And you know what goes on in the White House briefing room is often you know, it's reporters performing for other reporters. Well, in fact, it's theater on both sides, isn't right. it? Right, right. So you covered the big dog all those years, huh? So what was he like? T talk about Clinton. You must have had a lot of interaction with him. What was he like? Um, I, you know, it, you never really know uh, what they're like because it, with politicians, you know, if, if you're a reporter, they are all, always on. They're always sort of almost performing when they're in front of you. But Clinton was a very um, interesting person. And at one point, after the whole impeachment um, saga, he took, I was on a trip to South America, and they invited about eight of us out to dinner with him. And it was a three hour off the record dinner. But one thing that was clear is that this guy just was still, this goes around in his head constantly. And I'm now reading, the, Taylor Branch has a new book out called The Clinton Tapes. And you can, you can really see, you know, that, that it is just something that he is never going to kind of get over or ever going to feel like he's truly vindicated. So when he goes on uh, Meet the Press two weeks ago and he talks about the vast right-wing conspiracy, he's really as much projecting his own view of things these years later as he is assessing the reality of a situation. Right, right. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm interested to be reminded that you left the White House beat in 2001 to become national political correspondent at exactly the moment that a fellow Texan was arriving in the building. Right. It seems like Time Magazine would have, would have demanded that you remain in that job to interpret the particular no. tribal habits of this, <laughs> of this guy, and in fact, that didn't happen. Did you leave that beat by choice, or did they ask you to leave? Um, I, the... The person who'd been the national political correspondent had gotten promoted to my boss, and he asked me if I wanted the job. And I felt like, as I said, I, I don't think the White House is something I wanted to do forever. And as national political correspondent, I just really feel like I have a much greater um, latitude to cover stories that I think are interesting. But I, I'm still over there a lot. I mean, I, I interviewed Obama in, in July, uh, on health care. Right. So it's, it just gives me a chance to expand. Looking back over those eight years, do you wish you were in there with them? I mean, no. No? Don't, no, no. no. <laughs> Why? Because it is so confining in that mm -hmm. building. Um, but wouldn't he have been interesting and fun to cover? But I still, you know, was able to sort of, uh, without doing the beat, I was certainly able to cover Got all the George benefits, Bush, but, yes. but none of the things. All right, so assess either from your perspective as a Texan or from your perspective as a human being. Assess those eight years. What do you, what do you think about, uh, what, what, what are we to make of it? I know that it's, it's still pretty close, but as you look back. You know, first of all, the, the difference between the first Bush term and the second Bush term um, were really night and day. And I, I don't think we have yet to sort of unspool what happened and where the kind of break was between the sort of Bush-Cheney administration of the first term and the real George Bush, almost like the Bush-Rice administration of the second term. You make that much of a distinction between, between the two terms. <clears throat> Absolutely, I think a lot, you know, a lot of what happened in the second term was trying to sort of walk away from a lot of what had happened in the first term. So the reporting that Time Magazine, I think, in fact, did in great detail several months ago on a rift that had developed at the end of the administration between President Bush and Vice President Cheney, you give credibility to the factual premise of that, that yes. there was a division between the two. Right. Right. Do you think that the president now looks back and thinks to himself, I have regret over placing so much of the administration in the hands of the vice president? Oh, boy. You know, I, I will be interested in reading his memoirs on that. Um, you, think, I, you think he'll actually address that? No, I mean, George Bush is not somebody who I think 
I mean, has that sort of way of looking at things. Um, but but you do have to you do have to wonder. Right. Um, let me before we open up the the audience to questions of you, better questions I'm sure than I've asked so far. Let me ask you about Obama. What's your mm -hmm. read on Obama? You said you interviewed him in July. You've obviously watched a lot of presidents now come and go. Um, is he up to the job as uh, as his supporters say, or is he uh, is he an accident of history, as as the critics uh, of the presidents will say as well? Um, well, you know, in a few months when he wins the Heisman Trophy, we... Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> um, that was the best line of the day, sir. Right. <laughs> um, I, I think that what is just astonishing about this presidency is not only how much has been put onto his plate, but then what he has chosen to take on. And I think health care being Exhibit A, I mean, this is a president who has decided that he is going to do very big things. And he is going to be judged by whether he can, you know, this, this is not small ball. This is large ball. Yes. Yeah. Is he, is he um, concerned so much? Do you get the impression he's concerned about how he'll be viewed? Will it be sufficient for him? Will he consider himself to have been successful if he tries these big things and fails for having tried them? Um, Boy, how he considers himself. I mean, he, is, he is a man of just extraordinary self-confidence that would not, he wouldn't be where he is if, if he didn't have that. So, is, is it arrogance, as some suggest, do you think? You know, I think that if he fails at this, I think that is, that is how it's going to be read. That the, that, the, that the result will be the basis for interpreting the lead up to the That it was just too much. And it's really yeah. interesting because, um, you know, as much as people were making a lot of what happened in August with the crazy town halls and the death panels and all that stuff about health care, I had had my interview with Obama in the fourth week of July, and he had it was he was surprisingly frank about his own difficulties in in his own worries about the fact that he was losing the public, that he was that people had decided that he was taking on too much and that it was just all about big government. And he said, you know, it's, it's the greatest frustration of my public life that I cannot find a way to communicate with what to me should be the simplest case possible to make. And it was, it was the first time I had ever heard that kind of self-doubt coming out of Barack Obama. And to hear him doubting his own abilities as a communicator was truly remarkable. And do you think that's affected his uh, rebranding of the health care reform bill as we've seen in the last couple of weeks? That was the, that was the very point <clears throat> at which he suddenly started calling it health insurance reform as, as opposed, opposed to, to health, health reform. Health care reform, right. All right, speed round before we open it up to the mm -hmm. audience. Um, who will be the Republican nominee for president in 2012? Oh, my gosh. Oh, I'm, I'm always terrible at these things, so put, put nothing to... I would say Tim Pawlenty is the guy you ought to keep an eye on now. By the way, he's going to, apparently he's going to Iowa now, too. Yes, he is, that's right. Um, will health care reform pass by the end of the year? Yes. Will there be a public option? No. Will the Dow get to 10,000 before unemployment gets to 10%? <laughs> no. Yes. Will uh, Texas win the national championship? It better. Okay. <laughs> Let's give Karen a hand.